Like if I could go back and meet a younger me, I would just smack me. I I know. Don't I, be stupid. Don't make bad decisions. <laughs> exactly. Today we are uncovering spiritual themes in the movie The Flash starring Ezra Miller, Michael Keaton and George Clooney. So there's actually a particular spiritual theme that's very critical to the plot in this movie. So I'm wondering, we all saw the movie this past weekend. What spiritual themes and character journeys did you see in the film and how are they resolved? I think just about every character in this movie had a spiritual journey or, you know, some kind of a, a issue or a crisis that they were trying to get over. Like every single character introduced had something serious going on. So you could talk just about, you know, or talk about just about any one of them, really. Yeah, that's kind of what I saw, too. Like one of the core themes of the movie was coping and how do you cope with tragedy, a desire to undo the tragedy, even though that's not necessarily possible for most of us. So I made this little short back when we first saw the trailer for this movie. And that's what I thought this movie was going to be about. I thought it was going to be about Flash can go back and change the past but the rest of us can't. So I thought there has to be something that he's not going to be able to change. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to relate to the character at all, right? Yeah. And then, then it will come down to how do you learn to accept something that you can't change that's tragic or difficult to deal with. What about you, Doug? You, you got to hit the family part hard. Um, the love, uh, especially for you know the love of a parent, the love of a child. Uh, things like that, what you would do, would you go over the line for that love person? And then, you know, it's all about how do I deal with the consequences? What consequences are coming my way? Do I deserve these consequences? Do I not deserve these consequences? We can go down a big rabbit hole with all of that. So, but yeah, I mean, you you can find little things, spirituality, like you said, and other people struggle, you know, it's the, uh, the struggle to be relevant, Batman, you know, I mean, in that universe, Gotham's the safest city in the world, which is weird. So and he's just now a hermit, no friends, you know, he living in this huge mansion without even a butler. So, you know, it's uh, dealing with things like that. That's got to be tough, too. So yeah, I wonder if he was supposed to be going through an identity crisis. Or a loss that's, of purpose. That's kind of what I gathered. You know, his hair's long. He's got this beard. He's walking around with one sandal. He, I his, did not catch bathroom. that. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a sand, his, one of his sandals is just on the floor. Well, he threw it. Did Well, he? no. When they first walk into the kitchen, you see just a sandal. Oh, okay. And he's <laughs> hiding in the cupboard with his other sandal on in his bathroom, <laughs> making spaghetti. But no, he said that, you know, Gotham is the safest city in the world, and I wasn't needed anymore. So he just kind of like he lost his sense of purpose. That's the only thing that Bruce Wayne had, I guess, you know, you know, in those films, they never really went into what Wayne Enterprises did. They never talked about his Wayne Enterprises. He mentioned he had business meetings, but you never really got into it like they did with the Nolan trilogy. So apparently he just sits back and lets the money roll in. But his main purpose in life was being Batman. And now I'm not Batman. So who am I? And yeah. I just, I'm just an old guy who eats spaghetti in one, one sandal. That's interesting then, because when he puts that costume back on, I mean, he plays an awesome Batman. So yeah. that could signify, oh, I got my purpose back. And you carry that all the way to the end where he's ready to die for mm -hmm. everyone else. You know, he basically is almost looking for a meaningful death, like a purposeful death. So his yeah. life can have meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he even, like, you know, when he puts on the suit, his whole personality changes, you know? Like, they said they needed him, and he was just kind of like, eh. And then he, like, he immediately went and sh he looked at the bat suit, and he's like, yeah. And he immediately cuts his hair and shaves, and he's in the suit, and he's, like, ready to roll. Like, you know, I get to be me again. Yeah, I mean, it's just finding an identity. Uh, and Barry had the same kind of issue with his identity, you know? This is, I'm, I'm the Flash, and then when he lost his power, he didn't. Well, what do I do now? This isn't, and of course, the other Barry gets it, and he's completely irresponsible with it. So, yeah. So I'm glad you brought up the other Barry because it was this was really interesting. I feel like other Barry is what 
the flash would be if he never went through the loss of his mom. Mm -hmm. But the way they handle that is weird. I mean, is, I don't know if it's just because he's 18. The, the second Barry is like 18. He's a college student, Mm -hmm. Yeah. but like he is basically a bum and what were they trying to say there? Like, Oh, if you don't go through this tragedy, you won't grow up. I mean, that's kind of a, well, a, a hard stance by the movie. Oh, remember, he, again, he was 18. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think most of us act similar to that. I mean, obviously, they're going for laughs, so they might have pushed it a little bit over the top. But still, yeah, if I were 18 was able to do that, I'd yeah. probably do a lot worse than he did. Yeah. And if you think so, about it, a lot of the things that we experience in life kind of mold you and make you who you are as an adult. I'm, you know, I'm a father of three kids. And... I'm the way that I am with my kids today is because of the way that I was brought up that molded me. This is like, this is how I'm going to treat my kids because, you know, I'm going to give them things that I didn't get. So that makes you, you know, or or if you experience something traumatic, you know, it really shapes you. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think if Barry had gone through life and hadn't had that experience of his mom being murdered and his dad going to prison, he wouldn't have had to grow up so quick. He may have just been aloof the entire, his entire adult life. So I think that definitely plays into why he's the way he is. And being 18, obviously, is a a big part of that, too. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes good sense because we meet him right after that Ben Affleck scene where they're talking The Flash is talking to Ben Affleck and he basically tells him, our scars make us who we are. Like, why would you Mm -hmm. want to get rid of those? Uh, You know, we don't know who we'd be without them. Or I can't remember if he said that or Keaton said that, but you have that conversation. And then shortly after that, you see Barry, if he had not experienced any tragedy or didn't have any scars yet. So that that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am curious, what did you think of the two flashes, the dynamic of two berries? It was I, I it was fun. It was, I thought it was really fun too. I like watching. Yeah, I've always wondered what would happen if I ever met a clone of myself? Like if I could go back and meet a younger me, like how would that how would that pan out? I would just smack me. I I know. Don't I, be stupid. <laughs> don't make bad decisions. <laughs> exactly. Would you like yourself? I don't know. I think I would be I would. I would be Barry and I would probably feel the same way towards younger Barry, like younger me as he did towards younger Barry. I'd probably just want to knock the crap out of him half the yeah. time. Like, what are you? Stop. <laughs> Focus on something, you know? Oh, yeah. I know. I, I like the dynamic of those two. I, I thought their banter and back and forth was pretty interesting. You can definitely see the, the personality, same guy, but these different personalities because one guy has gone through this terrible tragedy and he's trying so hard to fix something that he wants fixed. And the other guy who's completely oblivious to what's going on just doesn't have a care in the world. I, I like that little back and forth that they had. Yeah, I have a little bit of a hot take because I really liked older Barry mentoring younger Barry. But I feel like all the young people in this film, they dialed up the crazy factor to 11. And like the joke <laughs> meter is on 11. So if you watch the movie again, every Gen Z person is portrayed as like a maniac. So I was like, who wrote this movie? Was this intentional? Like, were you trying to get young people to laugh? Or is this an older person who is having a negative view of Gen Z or something? I didn't know. And so you've got two writers on this. One's 50 and one's like 36 or 35. So I really don't know. But I, I did think that was weird. Like, they're all, you know, the coffee shop worker, the oh, other yeah. roommates, like they're all just bonkers. So I'm not sure what that meant. Actually, Maybe they're I, think just going it, I think for it, jokes. I think it pulls to both audiences because, you know, uh, me as an old dude and you guys as not as much as old as me dudes. Almost um, as old as you dude. Yeah, you know, so um, anyway, you know, we we look at people acting like that and we're like, that's stupid. But (laughs) how different is that? You know, I mean, it's a different way of doing it, but we did pretty much the same thing when we were that age, just not online or not with, you know, virtual reality. You know, we did it with Nintendo and passing notes in class. So, so yeah, when we see something like that, it's like, oh, come on. 
you know, you're, you're acting like a fool in public where 20 years ago, I would have been doing something similar, acting like a fool in public. And my dad would have been sitting there going, Doug, <laughs> he was, yeah, but story. yeah, you story. know, so, but at the same point, kids that age see that and it's like oh i want to try that you know if you if you think back to the vine days maybe 10 years ago i never would have filmed myself jump i I don't think i would have filmed myself jumping into a pond at the uh, mall or something like that fountain sorry at the mall but if i were hanging out with my friends when i was 18 they dared me to jump in there i might have so what's the difference you know yeah so um but that's just kind of how we think, you know, our, you know, generation above us, not the same about us. We think the thing same about the young, you know, generation Z in 20 years, generation Z will be doing a podcast like this going, God, a generation fart is awful. <laughs> Maybe I mean, they I... gotta be getting dumber, right? So we gotta come up with the drum. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Maybe they confused me when they cast Keaton because when they cast him and the trailer was fairly serious that I saw, you know, I saw a couple trailers and they didn't have a lot of jokes in them. I knew there would be some based on Ezra Miller's flash and justice league. Yeah. But when you cast Keaton, I'm thinking we're going to get like a Batman 89 Batman returns vibe. And those trailers showed a lot of seriousness on the loss of the parents and the longing and the, the loss of the mom's very similar to, Batman's loss of his parents. And I expected like a Batman 1989 vibe and about like 20 or 30 minutes into the film, I'm like scratching my head. Like, (laughs) am I watching Spider-Man two or Spider-Man three or, or Batman and Robin? And I'm like, wait, wait, they're going to mix Keaton into this movie soon. So eventually I, I started to believe, I don't, I don't know if I want that. I don't know if I want Michael Keaton's Batman put into basically a Batman and Robin. So maybe now that I know what to expect, I might do better watching the first half of the film, but I was struggling with that when Michael Keaton was introduced. I was like, really? Well, his acting is amazing, but this is tonally different than like his character is tonally different than the tone they set up. Yeah. I felt like I um, actually said, he, Doug, this feels like Batman. That I mean, Keaton, when Keaton came on, we said this, man, this is fun. This feels like I'm watching the Burton Batman. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, he was different. You know, this isn't this isn't 89 Batman anymore. This is 2023 Batman. So he's older. He's been doing nothing for 10. I mean, who who's he talked to? He's Mm -hmm. in that mansion by himself. How long has he been in that mansion by himself? You know, other than people delivering him food. He's just walking around eating spaghetti with one flip bottle on. <laughs> so <laughs> growing his hair. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I longer, got that vibe. But I did. No, but yeah, too. that's it. Yeah. That's why the vibe I think was different. Yeah. One the reason. longer the movie went on, the more I liked it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I I felt like on the first half I wish they dialed the jokes back a little bit and just picked the best ones. I'll oh, see that and, is I was gonna say that was Marvel slash Joss Whedon's fault because Marvel Marvel did the joke train joke 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 and it was fun it was something different for us but now we're into phase seventeen or whatever with Marvel and they're like still doing jokes I mean God love him I love Chris Hemsworth but that fourth Thor movie was awful I still haven't seen that one yet because that's all it was how many jokes can we to pile Batman on Robin. yeah so. Anyway, um, you know, the first few like uh, Man of Steel and um, Batman v Superman, those were pretty dark with a few jokes spattered around here and there. Now, I think they could have done better with the stories, but I really like that tone. And that's what I'm blanking on his name. Snyder was going to do with Justice League. Well, then his father passed away and they needed to bring somebody in. Joss Whedon just... What's that? I, I thought it was his daughter. Was daughter. it his daughter? Yeah. Okay, my bad. My bad. So DC is like, well, hey, Joss Whedon killed it with Marvel. Come on over here. And he's like, well, I'm just going to do Marvel again. It 
worked for me the one time. No, you're coming to a different comic book and we need to stick with the darker tones. And then they just kept going with it. <laughs> They're like, well, it works for Marvel. We might as well do it too. You know, if nothing would have happened, Snyder would have done Justice League. I think we'd be seeing a completely different DCU today. Yeah. Because, maybe. and, and, you know, I'm not taking, I don't want to say I'm talking bad about Joss Whedon. I've loved a lot of his older stuff. Yeah, he just completely changed it and just made Marvel light, basically. And it's like, we okay, we're already getting sick of it over here. We don't want it here, too. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I think that's why you see such big numbers for shows like The Boys on Amazon. You know, everyone's watching that superhero show because it is way too dark. Yeah. yeah. What do you guys think, since coping is the major theme of this film, what do you think the film is ultimately trying to say about mental health battles and coping and learning to cope? I think it's, you know, one way to look at it is it's going to be hard, but you've got to deal with it because you can't change it. And even if you have superpowers that can make you run to a weird room where you see a crazy looking dude running at you and you can go and save your, you know, change that moment. Even with that, it never works out. You know, losing somebody, I mean, anything bad, it's hard to cope with. And obviously uh, when it came to his mom, who I didn't realize Ezra Miller had Latino in him, by the way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, yeah, once uh, you know the loss of a mom, that's got to be rough. And it obviously was because he was what seven, eight, something like that, seven or eight when his mom died. And he's probably twenty five now in the TV show, I would guess, or I mean in the uh, movie. So um, you know, we're talking almost twenty years, and he's still just thinking about her daily to the point where he's going to possibly mess a lot of things up it's it's a roundabout way of looking at it but it's like look you have to find a way whether it's praying whether it's going to therapy whether it's talking to your best friend you know you've got to get it out there and just be like let's talk about it let's get through it and you eventually have to be able to cope because if not you're What's going on with life? I mean, you're going through your entire life sad. Yeah. It's not worth it. It's basically a movie about acceptance. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. I like the way they handle it because I was looking for them to like tell us how we can get through our stuff. And I did feel like, I mean, I don't want to skip to the, necessarily the end of the movie totally because we've got a lot more to talk about, but when he goes back to that store and sees his mom one last time, I felt like he's basically saying goodbye to mm-hmm. her. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, he's never going to forget her, but he, he's basically accepting that he can't change what happened and he's going to basically continue living. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. acceptance is the biggest part of of all of that. You know, I, we, I had a rough I had a rough year last year. Um, I lost three people uh, that I was close to. So it was like getting hit right one after another. And it was hard. I think, I think there was a good period for at least one month where I was probably crying like every single day for about two weeks, which is again, part of that process. You know, you're, you're hurting and you got pain and you have to have a release. You can't hold it in. You hold it in bad things are going to start happening. So you have to let it go somehow. And like Doug said, that's either going to therapy or talking to a friend about it or whatever it is, you have to do something to cope. But it's when you finally accept it happened and that's that final step. And then once you do that, it's, it's easier to move on with your life. And the way that I cope with it is I just whatever anger, sadness, whatever I have in me, I have to get that out. And then once I'm done, I can stop and think about that person and think about memories and not be sad anymore. It's almost like, you know, I, I, you look at more of a, I'm not, I'm not sad that they're gone. I'm more happy that I knew them. And I am happy that I have these memories that I can remember these good times. And that's the, you know, it's the way I always coped with it. But wait, once you do the acceptance part, that's, that's, that's the part you got to get to. Yeah. So I think Barry's way of finally getting that acceptance is just to realize that I can't change things. I, I change that. If that changes, everything else changes. I still have these memories. I still have this. So yeah, it's just finally time to let go. Yeah. You actually get to see what happens when a person 
doesn't ever reach acceptance because that that's what younger Barry's character is. I mean, he becomes reverse flash. He spends his whole life refusing to accept what happened and he almost destroys the universe, which, which is interesting because you could look at it like if you don't accept that bad things happen. I mean, I'm not very good at that. You do kind of lose some of your life and affect the world around you. But it's interesting that we got to see both possibilities. We got to see the Barry that accepts what happened and the one that didn't and how that affected the universe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was cool. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he wasted his entire life trying to make a change that, you know, after you try it like 15, 20 times, you, you're kind of like, this isn't going to work. And that's where you just have to say, you know, it, it is what it is at this point. But yeah, he refused to accept it. And it's kind of a weird paradox that the the, the evil guy was created by Barry. They call that a, uh, oh, what they call it? Some kind paradox? of a loop. Uh, it's not, it is, but it's, uh, there's a certain name for it and of how that loop starts. Like the original guy somehow comes out of his he goes into a time machine, but he comes out at a different angle and he hits his first self, which knocks it off angle. And that's what starts the loop. Does that make sense? Like if you're hitting a, if you're hitting a cue ball into the time machine and it's starting to go straight, right? It goes Mm -hmm. in. And, but when it comes out from the past, it comes out at the wrong angle and it hits the original ball. Right. Mm Hmm. Well, now it's knocked ball A off its course and it goes off into an angle into the time machine, which is the exact same angle that it came out of. So that's what starts the loop, if that makes sense. Interesting. So that's what happened with Barry. It is deep. I had to look that up because like, because they called it a loop and I was reading a summary and I saw the loop and I was like, oh, what is this? And I read about it and it's like, oh, so... While Flash is doing his backwards thing, at one point he came out of time and hit himself and bumped in a different direction, which caused the reverse Flash to start. So, yeah. Wow. I can't <laughs> have a name for it, but. When he's in that time travel room, I'm going to call it, where he can see all the different possibilities. So he's running and he can see all these different timelines, basically. A spiritual theme that stuck out to me there is he's basically in the position of God in that moment. But the difference is he doesn't have necessarily the knowledge of how all these timelines are going to work out. Mm-hmm. It's like he has to try them, I think, and see if they work. So he's he's not all powerful, but he has the vantage point of God because, I mean, from a theological perspective, you know, we believe that God could see all possibilities and therefore knew how to affect things in our world to get a certain outcome, right? So, you know, like he knew when to send Jesus into the world, things like that. So that's basically where where Flash is, but he kind of lacks the know-how to actually be able to get where he wants ultimately. Yeah, that makes sense. What do you guys think of (laughs) Supergirl's theme and her character? That um, was interesting too, because I I thought when they went to get her, you know, when they got when they're going to go get you know Jael uh, out of yeah, they're gonna pull him, you know, him is what I kept thinking. Kal El, I thought they were gonna Kal El, and I knew that he did so, say he did say Jal El. I said Jal, yeah, Kal El. Jor El, is that his dad? Jor El, yeah, Jor El's his dad. I was getting them confused there for a second. Um, I knew that Supergirl was in this. Or the lady was in this dressed up. So my, what I was thinking was that that was going to be Superman. But in this timeline, Superman's a, is a girl. You know what I mean? I did. So, but when they found out, well, I'm I'm the cousin. It's like, oh, okay. So you are, you are the cousin. So I thought they were going to flip that around a little bit, but. In that world, the gene pool they used up on Krypton totally flipped everything. She went from a blonde white chick to a <laughs> uh, Latino. Was a le- was she? I think she's Colum- Colombian. Colombian. Yeah, yeah. She could was- be wrong, but that was interesting. I love how she got her powers back as soon as she got outside and the sun got her, and she's just like, ah. <laughs> went from yeah. this yeah. week. 
it was a really it was a really good message of um, you know you can say acceptance but learning trust because she came to Earth what was immediately imprisoned put out of the sun so she could never have her strength by humans and now she's saved by humans and she's got to figure out. Okay, maybe not all humans are like this, and you do see her, and then she finally does become part of the team. So, yeah. yeah. She had one really good line about that, and I can't remember what she said, but something to imply that, you know, she's only seen terrible things from humans. Right. And then Barry helping her made her realize that not all humans are bad. And that was really interesting. Like, is humanity worth saving? And you're, you're weighing that you've seen more terrible things by them than good things. I mean, that could have been a whole movie. But mm-hmm. that was a really interesting spiritual theme. Mm-hmm. That was pretty cool. It was interesting how they did that, because um, the whole story. Because I don't know if... Uh, I, I talked to Drew about it when we watched it. But Nathan, have you ever seen the cartoon movie called Flashpoint? I believe I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, it came out I'm years ago. But... Yeah, that's basically what this movie was. In Flashpoint, the Flash goes back to save his mom, but completely rips everything up. So in uh, Flashpoint, I'm going to throw spoilers out here as well. Uh, He gets to uh, the new generation or new uh, universe, and he's like, something comes up, and he's like, I got to find Batman. So he runs to Gotham, and he actually drives because he does lose his power. And he gets there and, you know, he sees some thugs and he's like, here it comes. And then this guy in a bat suit jumps out and kills these guys. Just straight up kills them. And come to find out, that's not Batman. I mean, he is Batman, but it's uh, Thomas Wayne, not Bruce Wayne. Oh, yeah. Because in the alley, it was his wife and his son who got killed. (laughs) Oh, wow. And also in this universe, the Atlanteans and the Amazons are at war. So you've got, you know, these sea creatures and these powerful women going to battle. Superman is in the uh, basement being held. So when they find Superman, he's just this scrawny little dude, just like, you know, uh, everything like that. So it was uh, it was uh, based off that loosely. Mm-hmm. So, like I said, um, I think um, actually Drew heard me whispered in the movie. This whole time, I really thought um, Michael Keaton was going to be Thomas Wayne. Yeah, knowing knowing that, I think in the theater, I actually went oh. Thomas. Well, when he saw the beard that and the long been. hair, because they had when they first showed Keaton and he had the long hair and the beard. That's when they were doing that fight. That's when he leaned over and goes, "Is that Thomas Wayne?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I wasn't expecting him to look." look like that so So anybody who's a fan of superheroes dc if you haven't go check out the flashpoint cartoon i think came out in like the mid 2000s or something like that it's actually a really good movie it's about an hour and a half hour and 20 minutes something like that uh has all the characters in it but they're all completely different it's it's pretty cool interesting so but Yeah. yeah that's how what this movie was based off of See, when we were watching this movie and it's basically they took the end of Man of Steel and they inserted all these characters into it. Right. So they're having to to fight Zod all over again. Mm -hmm. I thought Supergirl, since she was in the role of Superman here, I thought she would have some kind of Jesus symbolism to her character. But I didn't really see it in Man of Steel. They intentionally put. Superman and all of these Christ poses and things like that Mm -hmm. and and talked about him as the savior. So he was intentionally by the writers made to be a Jesus figure. And that's true to the history of his character too. He's, he's been portrayed as a Jesus figure before, but I didn't really see that in her character. She was more of just like a, a tortured soul. The only thing I could think of if there was any metaphor to be had there would be a resurrection metaphor because when she's in Russia held in that, it's an underground facility, right? Yeah. It looked like it was. Well, in ancient times during Jesus's time, people believed that when you died, 
your your soul went to a place called Sheol, which was under the earth. It was in the earth. So her character is being held in this prison in the earth for who knows how long. And, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. So here she rises out of Sheol, where Jesus was thought to be, and is powered by the sun again. And then basically she saves them in that fight and, and gets them out of there. So I wondered, I'm like, I don't know if there's anything there, if that was an intentional thing or not. I'm going to guess no, but I did wonder since Superman is portrayed that way. It's interesting. I don't think she was, they were trying to push her as a Jesus figure because I think they were trying to separate Superman and Supergirl completely by showing that for this to all work out, this had to be one of those points. I can't remember exactly what they called it, but this is one of those points where Superman had, yes, Superman yes. had to be there because she could not beat Zod. Batman I had a could theory. not beat Zod. Mm. So I don't think they were trying to, because if Superman is the Jesus figure, they don't want to make her the Jesus figure as well, because right. she's the more, I think she's kind of more the protector. So, who protects Jesus? The the God? The no, no. Um, Steve. He walked around with the apostles, right? Yeah. He, he was the, he was the guy that was good with the spear. Steve the apostle. I don't know. I have talking. never oh, read no. the book of Steve. Rufus. <laughs> Rufus. That's what it was. Rufus. <laughs> well, he showed because, up in that one movie. Because of what you're saying, that Superman had to save the day, and he wasn't in this universe. I thought since they didn't show, well, they're, they're never going to show a baby being killed by Zod on screen, but because right. they didn't show him killing Superman as a baby, I expected, I knew Nicolas Cage was going to show up in this film at some point. As oh, he Superman. Did. I did. I had no that. idea. No I, idea. I, didn't I know thought Nicolas Cage was going to show up as Superman and he was going to be the way that they defeated that timeline. And so and your, head what we got, your head would have exploded. Yeah. Well, what we got was, was almost cool. as good. It was him it showing was up and defeating Zod would have been incredible, but it, it would have, it would have messed up their spiritual theme of having to learn acceptance. Yes. They can't win that battle if they're going to make a satisfying dramatic theme there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting how they how they did that. Because I, I was one hundred percent expecting them to everything to be a happy ending. I didn't expect Batman to die. That like they he crashes the plane and I immediately knew, oh, they're gonna go back in time and fix that. I didn't see it the second time. I had no idea that was gonna happen again. And I didn't think so I thought like they would both survive at the end of that. But no, that's uh that was a that's a really good point that they made though. What what did you think of Batman's sacrifice? It had meaning, and I think that's the thing that he had been looking for. He he had lost, like you said, it, he had lost his sense of purpose. He had been Batman and saving people for so long that when he doesn't have it, he doesn't know what to do. So I think he actually took it almost looked like he was having fun during the battle, you know, flying the Batwing around and Yeah. You know, he's he's happy. He's smiling and having a good time and but no, I think oh. that he he knew that he had to make, he was going to make that sacrifice the first time when he crashes his ship. He, I'm going to take these people out because this is what I do and I'm going to sacrifice myself for it. And I'm cool with that. So he had 100% acceptance of this is how, this is what I have to do and I accept it and, and he went with it. So yeah, I thought it was a very satisfying end for him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you gotta have the, uh, Hero, hero's death especially when you've put that much time into it because someone like me i plan on dying at the age of 127 in my sleep that's how i want to go but somebody who is you know and, and this is i mean obviously yeah that'd be great but um <laughs> you know if you talk to people who have been truly in that type of life you know whether it be uh the good you know military uh, police, things like that, or the not so good, the gang and stuff like that. 
you know, if you talk to the true hardcore people who have been, this is their life the entire time, they don't want to retire. They don't want to stop until they have to and or until they just can't go anymore. Mm -hmm. So when that opportunity came up, I like Drew said, he was having fun because he knew I get to finish what I started. You know, I get to finish doing what I love. Because I, you know, I think he knew that at some point he may have to make that sacrifice and he was ready to do it because if they defeat these guys, that means he's just going right back to his mansion and eat spaghetti. With one yeah, where he has no one, up. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It did feel like it was a meaningful death. I kind of thought because his sacrifice didn't help them win the final boss, basically, like Zod still defeated Supergirl. I... Then I was like, okay, if they don't undo this, I'll be a little let down because his death didn't actually have any meaning in terms of the overall battle of the plot. So then they go back again, and then he dies again. And and then I started to wonder, I'm like, where's this going to go? So the way they left things, I mean, he could ultimately come back. Keaton could come back at some point, right? He might not be from that timeline, Mm -hmm. but there could be a Keaton somewhere else because there's a there's a Barry Allen somewhere else that looks like Ezra Miller, right? So yeah. they could have brought Batman back, Michael Keaton for Batman Beyond. No, oh, well, I mean you, we said, you could bring any of them back because they were they're kind of showing that at the end with the multiple Batman, Superman yeah. that were all different. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, there absolutely could be multiple michael keaton's but there could be also val kilmer's obviously there's still a george clooney you know there could be a uh yeah christopher nolan batman whose name i'm blanking on right now christian bale christian bale thank you oh my thing i forgot his name on a christian network huh (laughs) (laughs) michael keaton i thought his acting was awesome in this movie so Um, uh, i would his acting is always awesome bring him back yeah yeah I think I mean, he actually genuinely enjoyed putting that bat suit back on. I don't. I oh think yeah. some of it really came out in his acting and his performance was just how maybe how thrilled in real life he was to be mm-hmm. being Batman again. My only yeah. my only complaint is they recycled every single key line Batman ever said <laughs> yes. in this movie. It's like. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Yeah, no, yeah. That he one said, didn't quite said fit. the thing. He said the yeah. thing. Yeah, but, you know, you can only say, "Hey, it's so you know when he said it. You can only do that so many times in a movie. But by the time they were in that big fight, it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> His suit though was words. amazing. I've always loved that suit, and since he could barely move in 1989's Batman and Batman Returns. You know, he he like barely threw a punch in those movies. Mm-hmm. So to see Keaton's Batman in that suit actually fighting, I mean, I know it was probably give you a stunt that, yeah. double, but it was awesome to see that on screen finally. Mm-hmm. They have yeah, the technology like, to make uh, it happen. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot like uh, the original uh, Star Wars. You know, that fight with um, Darth Vader and Obi-Wan is just so slow but a few years back somebody uh went online did a uh digital version of the fight it was awesome amazing (laughs) and uh they cut in the original i mean the way they shoot it they actually put a grain on it so it looks like it fits right with the other scenes you see luke and han and chewbacca and leia running in the background well these guys are just going at it so yeah it was kind of that feel or you know when the first time we went and saw phantom menace yeah. You know, we never saw lightsaber battles like that. that was and all a of a sudden, one. yeah, you know, he breaks out the double sword and it's two on one. Just like, okay, this is, uh, even though there's Gungans running around going, ah! <laughs> that fight scene was awesome. Yeah, That's how I, I felt like very number two was. He was the Jar Jar of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> or he would, th- he there were certain the parts. Relief. No, I mean, Jar Jar was much worse. There were certain parts, though, where they were setting up a dramatic scene and they should have made you feel that. And then you didn't because Barry number two did his crazy laugh or he did mm-hmm. something and he, he did interrupt those dramatic moments. Yeah. So th- that's one reason I was like, ah, they should have dialed this back a little bit because the powerful moments didn't land as 
powerfully as they could have because they threw in the Jar Jar factor. Jar Jar yeah. Binks. Um, that, that's my new pet peeve with movies, okay? Now, my biggest of all time, and it's still up there, is unnecessarily putting the name of the movie in the dialogue, okay? No, we're not at the vertical limit. We're just really high up on a mountain, okay? <laughs> and guess what? In the movie, they went higher. So obviously well, they weren't at the vertical limit because they kept going vertical. Yeah. <laughs> Unless so, the movie, unless, uh, unless like the movie is is a name of a character, that's like yeah, the only yeah. time it's actually. Acceptable. I didn't get mad when they said Titanic in the movie Titanic. Right. <laughs> Obviously, the they have to say that. Yeah, yeah, the Flash. That makes sense. But but my new pet peeve is jokes are fine. I love jokes in my movies. I don't want something serious all the way through. I want something funny. I like to laugh now and again, but. You were starting to see this all over the place in Marvel, and then The Flash did it too. It's like, I don't need a joke every time the scene cuts. Yeah, you know, like, I mean, exactly. And I, yeah. I have notes here saying that what you said, you know, those scenes where it's just, it's drawn out, and then, you know, he'll be like, huh, and something stupid. And it's like, yeah. you just totally took, took us from here to here. Yeah, you're making and the a first movie time, about coping. Yeah. And well, let me let me figure out how to cope mm. with this movie before yeah. you interrupt my mm. my feelings. Yeah, you know? and the first time they did it, it's like ah, that's fine. Second time, it's like, yeah, that was that made me smile. By the end of the movie, it's like quit interrupting. <laughs> let they somebody got the say something right. nice. <laughs> they finally got the balance right in the last thirty minutes of this film. Yeah, I think so. That's yeah. when. Barry number two starts being a little more serious. Like earlier when Barry number one calls out, like, do you have to ruin everything? Like, are you ever serious? Like, I'm like, thank you. You should have done that 30 minutes ago. But by the end of the film, like we finally have Barry number two being serious, maybe too serious. And maybe his joking around, maybe that was a coping mechanism because we see here at the end, he doesn't really have a way to cope with well the tragedy yeah i mean he gets serious right after he hears that his mom dies yeah and that's why barry one came back and that's why he he does turn into i mean i don't they never say it i mean is he is he supposed to be the reverse flash at the end of the movie i think i think so um yeah so that that's something to look at too is because you know he he had his par- uh, parent, uh, parents there the whole time, unlike Barry Wan. So it was something that he never had to deal with. Where Barry Wan did, he had to deal with his mom getting killed, his dad going to jail. And he didn't have that parental guidance that made him safe until he joined the Justice League. So he was forced to mature up pretty quick. Yeah. Where... Barry too was still no tragedy, no nothing. And now I have all these powers and I'm feeling good. And what mom? And then he doesn't know how to handle that. Mm -hmm. And that's why he spends the next, uh, I'm assuming 50, 60 years or whatever, trying to change that moment so he can save his mom. He cannot deal with it. So in a way, Barry one did deal with it a lot better than, uh, Barry too. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, well, that is it, interesting it too, that, because he had the time to figure out how to process that. Yeah. Whereas now that I think about it, maybe this makes sense that Barry number two becomes the reverse flash because he gets his powers. And then like the next day he finds out his mom's going to die. And he obviously and he's in a huge battle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had a lot he had no time yeah, and this girl he had a crush on got killed. Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, there was obviously, you know, he had, he was into Supergirl, so. Oh, I didn't so, notice yeah. that. Oh yeah. Yeah, just yeah, kind of flirtatious. I mean, that's what I saw. I don't. I don't think they were really pushing towards it, but you know. There is an R-rated cut of the Supergirl Zod fight, and I would be interested to see that because oh, really? I, I really enjoyed her character when she gets really angry. Mm-hmm. There, there were moments when she first was introduced where they asked her to be maybe a, a tortured person or kind of emo and i didn't mm-hmm. feel like she really sold that but when she got mad yeah that was awesome i, I really want to see that fight so I'll, I'll be looking for a director's well, cut of this movie i 
would love to see a good story of Superman and Supergirl and how she was supposed to protect him. And maybe she needs to. Like there needs to uh, they need to have show him growing up. It's almost like in Smallville, it would have been kind of cool. I think she, well, she, she did show up in Smallville, but it would have been cooler that a she should have been older <laughs> because yeah. he was a baby when she landed. She was not, and two, oh wait, no, she came later. That's right. No, she was right age, but two, um, she's supposed to be the protector, so she needs to, to kind of be in the background watching him. And then not, I don't know, there's a lot going up up here. But I would love to see a good Superman and Supergirl together story that, or a good movie that tells a strong story or even Mm -hmm. a trilogy, you know, because there's a, there's a lot that can be told with family and, you know, this is, you know, we're family. Well, this is the family I grew up with. And, you know, there's a lot you can do with that. So I think that'd be a really cool story if someone could write it correctly. Mm-hmm. Another thing I, I remember saying to Doug watching this movie when, when they first show Keaton's Batman, he's Bruce Wayne. They're walking through Wayne Manor and they get up into the big library. That is like an exact replica of the room from Batman Returns, like down to the desk and what's on the desk. Like, so I have to give the movie guys. Uh, who created the set uh, a lot of credit because they did some research to making Wayne Manor look exactly like the Tim Burton Wayne Manor. Mm-hmm. They could have just filmed yeah. it in any big room, you know, but they like details on that. So I just want to put that out there, but yes, let's talk about the really coolest part of the whole movie. The Nicholas Cage cameo. The, the Nicolas whole Cage cameos, all cameo. those cameos, all those cameos were pretty cool. I will throw out, and I'm going to jump on the bandwagon with everyone else. How could you not have Grant Gustin show up? He played the Flash yeah. on the TV show. Yeah, Ezra Miller showed up on his show as the Flash. So they have met before, and it's like you bring out all you know a bunch of the old Batman's, a bunch of the old Supermans. Why would you not mm-hmm. show? Well, I yeah, think they both said him Linda, and the '80s Flash dude. Well, they also said Linda Carter, who played. Wonder oh, yeah, Woman in the eighties. Yeah. I guess that she was in there. They took it out. Yeah, and there was a Henry Cavill scene that was cut too. But I, I think that was I did the see closing it, scene. I don't know that he was going to be in one of the worlds. There, there was an alternate ending, I believe, where Henry Cavill's Superman shows up uh, with mm-hmm. Batman, one of the Batmans. Yeah, but no, it was really neat when they were panning in and. They showed, you know, the old Reeves. I, can, I can't the, remember his name. Yeah, Reeves. That's Reeves it. from the 50s. No. George. Reeves. George Reeves. George Reeves. Uh, yes. From the 50s. And I was like, oh, look at that. And then, like, you know, the nice pan around to Christopher Reeves, the Superman, was like, oh, that is so cool. And then you see, like, an well, old they had Flash. Helen, Helen Slater there, too, as the uh, Supergirl. Yes. She was in that. And then the old Flash running. And then, you know, you see, you hear Adam West joker you fiend <laughs> and i loved that uh you can hear romero or they cut romero out but you can hear jack nicholson's voice i can't remember what he said but you hear him from that batman the funny part was that's <laughs> well, part of the showing movie. this so there's and we have actually discussed this before uh, on one of the other on podcasts podcast. yeah so they're showing superman and he's shooting lasers out of his eyes and he's fighting a giant spider and i nudged doug and i went <laughs> Look, giant spider. And he goes, oh, yeah. And then it pans around, and it's it's Nicolas Cage. Nick and we just, like, lost it. We're like, oh, my gosh, look at this. I don't and think the other two people in the theater knew what we were allowed. No, at. the funny the funny part about the that is, one, for people who don't know, Kevin Smith wrote a draft for Superman Libs, and – He wrote a draft and the studio said, yeah, this is great, but we want Spider-Man or spider We want Superman to fight a giant spider. Kevin Smith's like, I'm not, I'm not putting in a giant spider. So he didn't do it. And obviously they didn't make the movie based on his script. And Kevin Smith's talked about that before. Uh, Superman lives. It also happens to be the movie that Nicholas Cage auditioned for. And they have, uh, you know, test footage of him wearing the suit. 
So his cameo in this movie is obviously it's some of it's CGI, but it's based off of that audition. But the funny part is they put in the giant spider that Kevin Smith refused to put in for the movie. Yeah. They, they went ahead and put it yeah. in there anyway. So that's a uh, great that Easter egg. That was supposed to be a 90s Superman movie directed by Tim Burton after the success of Batman 89. Now, what I found out this week, what I heard is they did actually film new footage for that. That's a new cage clip. Is it really? I, th- I thought it was repurposed audition footage. <laughs> I thought it but was I CGI. Found out I thought it was CGI, it too. Is. And they all look no, CGI to what me. what they did was they made everything look CGI-ish because the director said he's trying to show you everything's distorted and this is how the flash would see things. So I, I thought they went overboard with the CGI, but, or, or maybe they could have done something else like make it a little wavy or, or blurry or something to signify mm-hmm. that you're looking at another timeline. Yeah. But they cartoonified it instead, which I feel like that's not what things would look like if you were looking at another time bubble. Right. But what do I know? <laughs> I, I loved seeing, cage show up though because i have always wanted to see that movie that never got made that 90s superman movie with nicholas cage and cage is my favorite actor if you didn't know that but um (laughs) no not i made the joke not too long ago that somebody asked me like what, what what would you do if you could be god for a day like would you ever want to be in his position my answer is no, but if I was, I would make Superman Lives become a real film. And that was like oh, a month ago. And wait, here we go. I just got my Nicolas Cage killing a spider. The giant spider. Oh, that was so funny. And uh, I will say um, it is one of the funny, one of the funnier clips I've ever watched. If you go on YouTube and just put in Kevin Smith's Superman, he does have a mouth on him. For any parents or any kids watching, just be careful. He says it all multiple times throughout the entire thing. But he tells that story about how they wanted him to put a spider in that movie. And the, and he's great. I know he plays Silent Bob in the movies, but the dude can talk. And he's hilarious. I mean, it is, it's borderline stand-up, mm-hmm. basically. But it's all true stories about him. So... I just, I, I really like the fact that, I mean, that just shows respect for Kevin Smith because that dude, everything he went through to write that movie and everything like that, and he finally got recognized as a Superman guy, even though it was the worst possible, you know, scene they could have shot. But yeah, it's it's just. Go go Google it, or um, like I said, look it up on YouTube. This producer that they had, uh, sh- what was it? Sh- was it Schumacher? No, it wasn't Schumacher. I can't remember the guy's name. But yeah, the, that guy was out there because he had, I mean, the spider wasn't the only idea <laughs> yeah. he had. So Didn't he produce Wild Wild West? He did. Yeah, yeah, what's in Wild Wild West? Spider at the end of it. A giant spider. <laughs> Just gave him the punchline to the whole thing, but okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What about the George Clooney cameo? That was cool too. I heard the that voice, was, and I thought it was I thought it was going to be Michael Keaton again. So I thought it was going to be Keaton again too. I didn't expect Clooney. Clooney I don't know what they were up. trying to say. I mean, is he in the wrong universe now? Or I don't know. I'm. I'm yeah, starting, to, change I'm starting to get tired of the multiverse. There had I don't to be know a consequence. Who's doing anymore. You know. Yeah, well, I think, John Krasinski was going to be Mr. Fantastic. Now I guess it's Kylo Ren. I don't know. (laughs) Well, from the spaghetti concept, my impression was that even if Flash went back and corrected what he had done and he didn't save his mom, even if he did that and he hadn't moved the spaghetti, it wouldn't necessarily go back to the original timeline. The past could change. Because you're now changing, you're not changing things back you're changing a new timeline. You're not really going back. You're you're changing a new timeline to another timeline. Yeah. So then point. the past changes again. And and he did talk to her. Yeah. So he that, talked to her. He already, you know, butterfly effect. I can't talk. Butterfly effect. Yeah, he did that, but then he also kept his dad from going to prison. So by changing just those cans, he's already started a new timeline. And mm-hmm. as Keaton said, your okay. timeline is like that spaghetti. Mm-hmm. You're not just changing the future, you're changing the past too. 
So that makes sense, I guess, that way that George Clooney is is Batman. So, and see, I thought even if he hadn't moved that can, it might change the past, not necessarily back to what it was, but to something new. But I don't yeah. know for sure. Interesting. So I, I thought that was hilarious. I yeah. I did like to see Ben Affleck again, too. And, and Gal he's Gadot. my favorite Batman. Now, I, I think Wonder Woman is awesome. She could be. She's probably one of the best things they have going on for themselves. Oh, one hundred percent. Unfortunately, she's done thing. now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, why? I, oh man, they they could have uh, they spoiled something good there. They did, but unfortunately, and this works for you know this is probably why Cavill uh, they they're getting rid of him too because they're going to need Superman and Wonder Woman for the next ten to fifteen years, and in ten to fifteen years, both Cavill and Gadot are going to be late forties, almost, you know, I mean, probably in their fifties. I'd go watch anyways, but I don't yeah, know. I'd, about do, I'd watch anything with Cal Gadot. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't care how old they are. I don't care if they make a Superman movie with Nick Cage right now and he's right. old. I would watch it. I would be there. Yeah. Now the DC be there is for a Batman up. movie with Keaton. Yeah. Yeah. DC's but all screwed up because we've talked doing about the right thing. Before. Yeah. Well, we were, we were talking about this before we actually started recording about how there are so many different, things going on with DC right now. Cause you've got, you know, the Pattinson Batman and then you've got the Affleck Batman, but neither one of those Batman are going to be Batman in the next Batman timeline. And they're scraping everything and starting over. You still got Bruce Wayne in Joaquin Phoenix's Joker too. Yeah. So technically win. now you got three Batman hanging around. And if you count Michael Keaton, that's four. We did hear Adam West. Um, you know, it's like, and the yeah. best thing they have so going for them this. right now is Robert Pattinson's Batman. But that first that. movie, it, it was oh, they're not scrapping successful. It. And yeah, they're going to make it an Elseworlds trilogy. So they're going to keep it's making like, Batman movies with him, but they're also going to make Batman movies with someone else that's going to be part of the main DCU. Yeah. I, I can see how I'm Pattinson saying, I'm wouldn't be tired of in this universe, too. I'm so but, tired of multiverses, too. They were going to make a Batman Beyond movie with Keaton, and he was going to mentor a younger Batman. And that got canceled before The Flash. But then they decided, well, if The Flash does well, we'll make Batman Beyond. But see, that's a mistake, though, because two things. I don't think you can look at Flash and decide whether or not you can make this Batman Beyond movie or not. People people will come out for that. Oh, I'd go see a Batman movie with Keaton. Yeah, if if Flash doesn't do well, it could be because of the Ezra Miller controversy. But I don't think people have faith ah, in 100% DC and in, in Warner Bros. right now because they've they've changed courses too quick. When they get something good, they look at what Marvel's doing and they're like, "Oh, we got to change again." And it, it's like, dude, your first movie might not be a box office success once you start a new plan. Like, mm-hmm. stick to it because Batman Begins was critically successful but it didn't make all the money it took the next movie to actually convince people that people waited until that came out on vhs to see batman begins and then they were like oh well this was a great movie and so then they started going to the theater like you must win trust back with the consumer that's well, what, that's thing. what i would like to say that's to how Warner marvel Bros. started off i mean i'm guessing iron man probably you know the original iron man probably didn't break 350 I'm guessing know. I have no idea. I mean, domestically, but I'm it wasn't, you know, what? it wasn't like everyone was like, oh, Iron Man movie's coming out. Wasn't the yeah. Hulk not good? Because uh, that was one of the first ones, too. Well, yeah. Well, uh, Iron Man was only 319 million domestic, 585 yeah, worldwide. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, so it wasn't a blockbuster by any means, but it was good. And like you said, you know, by the time it hit, uh, video. I think they were still doing video back then. Um, you know, everyone watched it and was like, "That's decent. Let's go watch this Hulk movie with it." Yeah. And it was. It wasn't bad. I mean, it was still CGI. Just hadn't gotten there yet. So you know, the Hulk along with Abomination, that all kind of was like eh, suddenly you're in a bit. Pixar film. Yeah. <laughs> but people went and saw that. And then when Iron Man 2 came out, everyone went and saw I that. saw that in the theater and without then seeing Thor Iron Man. Out. And well, Iron Man 3 finally got 1.2 billion. So yeah, if you Iron stick Man 3, stick yeah, the worst the plan, of them. Or Iron Man yeah. 3, yeah. If you stick with the plan, 
and you prove yourself, people come back. But I feel like every other DC film has been a bomb and they get scared. And so they keep scrapping plans and making new plans and scrap. I mean, they were after Man of Steel, they were going to fast track a Man of Steel sequel and it never came. So they finally made Batman versus Superman. But I just don't feel like they can stick to their guns when they have a good no. plan. I think well, they will is, now. Yeah. The other problem is, and Doug has mentioned this too, is Affleck never got his own just Batman movie. And they mm-hmm. should have done that. They should have done, you get your own movie, you get your own movie with maybe a cameo real quick of the other one, a movie, mm-hmm. then do Justice League. Instead yeah. of just going, hey, the second movie we do, we're throwing everybody in here together and learn who these people are real quick. Go. Yeah. Cyborg, you're not sure who he is? Well, you're going to find out real fast. Right. I mean, that dude was like in 10 minutes of that movie, and I haven't heard about him since. Right. Other than, you know, the mention of Arthur and uh, this Flash movie. Right. So, and you never will hear from him again, no. unfortunately. And I like that guy. I don't mean, I can't, don't know the actor's name, but he was really good yeah. in the part. C- Cyborg's a cool character, too, but... They they just kind of – so Affleck basically had supporting roles, well, Batman versus Superman, Justice League, he you know, and then uh, Suicide Squad. He was cameoed in that. and Oh, like for three seconds. Yeah, so it's like – I think he, he walked in the room and turned and went, and that was yeah, it. He never got like his that. own movie, so they should have done – they should have done something like that. Give give the mm-hmm. guys each their own little thing to do and then yeah. bring them together. Yeah, yeah. That but at Marvel that point – yeah, at that point, they had already done Avengers 2, and I think that's what they were scared of. It was like, oh, well, they're so far ahead of us. They've already done their group up. We need to throw our group up now. Let's go. And if they would have – no, you couldn't do this Flash as the opening. But if they would have done – I mean, I've never really seen a decent – You know, well, first of all, they've never done a Flash movie, really. No. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've watched a little bit of the Grant Gustin one. You know, it's it's decent. It's the WB or CW or CW. whatever it's called this week. So it's they don't have all the money. So the, the special effects are cheesy. You know, it's the same thing with Smallville. I had fun with it. It was cool. But at the same point, it was kind of like cheesy. <laughs> We're ready to see something bigger. So, yeah, it's like I need my origin story. And they kind of gave it to us in... Justice League, that 30 second video where Iris shows up when she crashed, and now they're she just kind of showed up in the movie again. They really didn't give her a good hello. It's just like, oh, that's somebody you know. Hey, somebody I know. I forgot she was in Justice League. Yeah. Yeah. In the in the Snyder cut, she wasn't in the original Justice League because he cut Mm -hmm. out all the origin stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why. Snyder Cut was over four hours long. And a lot better. <laughs> get everything. So much better. Uh, well, we've made it to the end of the film. Do you guys recommend The Flash? I thought it was a fun I do. movie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a fun movie. And look, I, I, I know this is a little controversial because of the whole Ezra Miller thing. And if you don't want to watch the movie, I, I get it. I understand. That makes sense. Um, but... If you can look past that, even if you, you know, wait for it to come out on video and go watch it at a friend's house so you don't spend a single cent doing it, it is a fun movie. Like we said, a lot of cameos in it, literal overboard with the jokes, <laughs> my opinion, but still funny. And like I said, even though we spoiled everything for you, there were some cool surprises in there. And I will say the special effects were really good in a lot of places uh we were talking drew and i were talking about that in the theater was when the two berries are like in the car i mean they're getting in the car and they're hitting each other and obviously they had a stunt double and they just cgi'd his face on but it doesn't look like tron legacy it doesn't look like scorpion king (laughs) Um, (laughs) it it looked like he was sitting next to him yeah there was only was one instance really that I noticed. Yeah, I missed the, that one. The you face not looking real. <laughs> the rest of the movie, it looked like that was like, it's almost like they just filmed him twice and they put it together. Except for the following babies. That looked weird. Yeah, that was, was kind of weird. But Michael kinda... Shannon's, yeah, Michael Shannon's face, Zod, I thought 
oh, he wasn't on set. This is totally CGI, but he was on set. Mm -hmm. So they just made his face look like it was projected onto his helmet. Well, he had a mask on, mm -hmm. mask over his face. So I don't know if they couldn't breathe. It's like a fishbowl thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it looked, I think it was in, I don't know. But. It looked odd. So there's places where the effects are really good, and there's places where it was yeah. an interesting decision. Yeah, I think yeah. the whole baby thing was, again, it was one of those, oh, let's have fun, make funny things, you know, and kind of reproduce what, again, well, actually it was Sony with the X-Men. What's his name? Quicksilver. Quicksilver, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, that, that is how you introduce a speedster. Yeah, that's the right impulse. I mean, that was just that was one of the cool, more cool words. English. I talk good sentence. Um, <laughs> that was one of the cooler scenes I had seen up to that point. Because I mean, you know, him running around in slow motion, you know, tasting the drink and just pushing guys around, and that was really cool. And you're I think right. they were kind of trying to reproduce that. So. I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. They basically reproduced that in that scene at the beginning. They've done that before. My kids watched a Sonic the Hedgehog movie that came out with Martinson, who played Cyclops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They get into a bar fight, and Sonic starts moving super fast where everything slows down. And he'll go by, and he'll like move something here, and then he'll tie this guy up in something, and then he'll knock something this way. And by the time he goes back to normal speed – Everybody just falls down because they're all either uh, punching yeah. each other. Or, yeah, so they've that's been mm -hmm. that's been duplicated a couple times. Yeah, so I, I did. I did think scene. about that as soon as that scene. he started doing that. I was like, again, come on. Yeah, just, just quit well, copying Marvel DC. <laughs> I mean, yeah, do your own thing. I am a Marvel guy, but I love DC. I want to watch some good DC movies. Wonder Woman, the original one, awesome. 1985. What is that piece of crap? I made it 30 minutes through and I haven't watched it's the rest Batman of it since. Batman and Robin, 2.0. Um, it's just like there's writers out there <laughs> that are good. I'm sure you'd like to work on it. You write movies. I mean, sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I I don't understand what people think sometimes. Yeah. I guess I just you know. Marvel came in. They said, "You know what, Kevin Feige, you worked on the X Men movies, and you're a computer, you're a comic book nerd, right? Yes. Do you know these stories? Yes. You want to run Marvel? Yes. They killed it. You know. And now, I mean, they're uh, DC's finally doing that by bringing in James Gunn. But uh, and, and I get it. You know, Kevin Smith movies are pretty raunchy, a lot of swear words. You know, blah blah blah. But he wouldn't do that for a DC movie." There's nobody in the world that knows comics better than him, I'm guessing, or very few. And he's a good writer. He's a great dialogue writer. If you watch his movies and you get past um, everything, the swearing and everything, he, he's funny. He's yeah. good. He, he even gets deep Which, in some of his movies. And I think he'd cut down the swearing a whole bunch for one of these oh, movies. Oh, yeah. There would be, mean, yeah. You know, he does very, it because very. it fits the tone of what he's writing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. he'd be um, very good at doing that. I mean, it, yeah. uh, Kevin Smith, would, I don't know if he ever watched the movie Red State. It's some political commentary and whatever. But it's a dark movie, but it's really good. And, you know, the conversations they come into. So it's like, why did they not just call Kevin Smith and say, hey, will you write all of our movies, please? And then we'll find some cool people to act in them in the end. And they would have killed it. He would have written a great stories. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I feel he like people knows who don't every character. Yeah, people who don't know the characters are making the decisions. And yeah. they're probably making the decisions based on the box office. So they get a good idea, but the box office doesn't replicate the success. They get spooked, then they try mm -hmm. a course correction, like a 90 mm -hmm. or yeah, a 180 well, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's um that's that's one thing good about the future is people's tastes in movies have gotten stronger and better because the people at DC until they hired gun, they're basically stuck in the eighties. What happened in the eighties? Hey, this movie came out and it did really good. It's called Rambo. Hey, I got an idea for a movie. I'm calling it commando. <laughs> and that's what they did. Yeah. Oh, Hey, there's this really cool movie called 
uh, blood sport. Oh, cool. And that's when they go in this room and they kick each other, right? Yeah. Let's do one about kickboxing yep. and get the same guys. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what they did in the eighties and nineties. They just reproduced crap and we were stupid enough to go watch it all, but not anymore. Yeah. Well, for so every we finally big, got past that. Yeah. For every big movie in the eighties, you can find the generic knockoff. <laughs> every there's 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 a generic knockoff for every one of them. That's funny. See, I I feel like well, I'll go ahead and tell my review here. My my, my final thoughts are: I was watching the movie for the first hour. I was like, "What the heck is going on? Did they just watch Spider Man three and Batman and Robin and Phantom Menace and put them together and make a baby?" <laughs> and I was like, "No, this is not the universe I want you to bring Keaton into." And I started to think, do I even want Keaton to be in this universe? Because they're going to taint him with the stupid stuff, right? There's a reason that Michael Keaton did not want to be in the Schumacher films. And now here he is in a Schumacher film, basically. (laughs) But I did get one over, especially by him, once they introduced him. And, And seeing the characters get more serious as the film went on, you're basically watching them mature in a short amount of time. I always like the Barry number one, Flash number one. I always like him. I, I like the way that he he's a more thoughtful character, I feel like. But Barry number two, I just struggled with the amount of jokes and the amount of chaos. So, yeah, my mm. recommend is this could be a very strong film if they dialed that back, dial the jokes back from 11 to like six, you know? five but i walked out of the theater kind of scratching my head i didn't know what i thought i had to sit on this film for a couple days and i I definitely think if you're a michael keaton batman film you should see it i like this new supergirl i like barry number one and i like that the film went for a serious theme about coping with tragedy and acceptance and you see failure and having to accept that. that that's a very realistic thing like most of us have to deal with in life so i guess i'm going to give them kudos for that and i'm going to say you should watch this movie i'll give it a i'll give it a recommend but maybe know what you're going into because that may have been what messed me up i was expecting batman returns and batman 89 tone and I got Batman and Robin tone, maybe Batman Forever tone. It wasn't quite as crazy, or was it? I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, I'd give it a. I thought it was. Yeah, I thought it, I, I would say somewhere right between Batman Forever and Batman Robin. Yeah, and and yeah, it, it was it very like, Spider Man three to me. Yeah, I, I immediately went Spider Man three, and then I immediately went. I am sick of the multiverse. <laughs> yeah. So it's Is there not, something else we can do a story on? I don't need to see 19 Batman. Just give me a good Batman and let him kick butt and I'm going to be happy. Well, I, I like I like all the different Batmans in this film, you know? like I, mean, I, I like seeing Affleck. I mean, I mean it was kind of cool, yes, seeing yeah. little things like that. But at the same point, it's like you're telling the same story yeah. over and over and over. Now we're going to, you know, with Marvel and... I'm looking forward to it. You know, there's going to be sick amount of uh, cameos in the Secret Wars movie, so I am kind of looking for it. But it's like after that, let's kill this multiverse. Let's get back to a core group. Let's find the Avengers and let's have an Avengers. If you want to do two different worlds and do like a West Coast Avengers, that's great. Uh, there's some great comic books with that too. But let's stick with one universe and try not to go overboard. I don't mm-hmm. need a movie every other month. Yeah, okay. it, it is. I'm good with that. I'm old. I don't go to movies as much anymore. <laughs> so give me two or three good movies and then give me a one or two decent Disney Plus shows a year. I'm happy, Marvel. That's all I need. And yeah. Let's cut back on the jokes about 25%. Yeah, I, I'd say it's it's worth seeing. It's not DC's best film and it is tonally all over the place, but it is in... It's got to be in the top three or four of, of the last 10 years of DC films, I feel like. Uh, aside from, I, I feel like the Batman's leading the pack there. Um, but in the in the post-Nolan DC universe, right. this is probably... Well, straight up DCEU. Four. 
I'm go- I'm gonna rank them. The Batman. Man, See, I, I don't even I don't even count is. that. Okay. Because he's not in that universe. Yeah, I guess not. But I would say if you stick with the DCEU. Shazam and Wonder Woman are are better than this yes. by a little bit, and then probably mm-hmm. this one. I I liked most of Superman and uh, Batman v Superman. I think they went way overboard. Batman v Superman too many too many stories in a two and a half hour film. They could have split that up into two, probably three separate movies, and that would have been awesome. I love the tone they're going for. And everything like that. So I like those two better than The Flash. I would say probably Flash is number five. Uh, Wonder Woman, number one. Shazam. I'll go Batman v Superman. Uh, Superman, re- is it Returns? I forget. Not Returns. Um, Man, Man of Steel. Steel. Yeah, Man of Steel. And then, yeah, this yeah. Flash. Yeah. So. I had no expectations for this movie when I went in. I was just excited to see Michael Keaton. Honestly. So I, going in with zero expectations of, of this movie, I actually really enjoyed it. All the way through, I had fun with the movie. I thought it was, I do agree, some of the jokes were getting a little stale. But I liked the story. I like how there was, it wasn't just fighting a bad guy. There was some deeper things that he was working through. And all of his guys that he looked up to, both Bruce Wayne's, had that advice to give him learning how, you know, he was obviously an outcast. He has no friends. He's actually making friends now and he's learning how to come out and do that stuff. So I enjoyed all that. And I thought Michael Keaton's Batman was obviously, I had a lot of fun with that. I recommend going to see it. I think if you don't take it too seriously, you'll enjoy it. If you're going to look for a masterpiece and you're expecting to be completely blown away, you'll be disappointed. Yeah. And don't, yeah. And just keep in mind that, this is where it's ending. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because there's, and what was up with it? Why did we wait, wait around 10 minutes for that stupid credit scene? Yeah, credit scene. <laughs> yeah. it, it just had nothing to do with anything. It's like, oh, Aquaman's drunk. Oh, he fell in the water. Just he to remind breathe. you He's that fine. there's an Aquaman movie coming out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like, He's going to have his face reason. down in a puddle of mud in that movie. <laughs> that's how it starts. That's probably how it starts. So, so maybe, you know. Yeah. I, I like this movie. I, I did like, that the villain is Flash himself. That is really interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. So instead of a, you, you think Zod is going to be a big enemy. villain? Yeah, yeah. And your own decisions put you in that you know, situation. Where if you can't cope, then you could harm yourself. You know, so everybody's just trying to figure out how to cope with life because it's difficult. But if, if you were to refuse to figure out how to cope, well, it could kill you basically. Mm-hmm. And that's what we see in the movie. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for joining me and we will be back soon. We're not sure what we're doing next, but we are doing a movie next. <laughs> so we'll see you guys soon. If you like this video, hit subscribe, turn on notifications. We'll be back with more movie reviews and some interesting content soon. We'll see ya. Later. See ya. Today, we are discussing spiritual <laughs> themes in the movie The Flash. I totally screwed Ezra that Miller up. You can start and over if you want. Michael. Oh, <laughs> like, should I keep going? <laughs> what should I do? I was confused. <laughs> I know what you were trying to do. <laughs> okay, that can be a blooper. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep that.